Today, we are very strategic, careful shoppers, at least more so than we used to be years ago. I, I know I'm that way when I go to buy anything big or small. Uh, I'm very cautious and uh, I, I, I'm careful. I, I try to think through it. Uh, most people today rarely buy in quickly uh, when we're looking to make a purchase of any size. And the reason for that is because there's been so many scams and misleadings over the years that you feel like you really can't trust the people selling you the items. And, uh, but, but you have to buy things in order to live. I mean, you, you have to buy cars and you have to buy electronics and you have to buy clothing and all the different pieces of life. So what is it that we do? How do we, how do we fix this? Well, we pull out that smartphone that's sitting in your lap right now or maybe in your hand or in your purse. And what do we take that? We take it and with the internet, we research and we research and we research and we compare different products. And then once we finish researching, then we look at reviews from other people who have bought that product uh, to make sure that we can be as sure as possible before we entrust our hard-earned money to some retailer. Um, there was a funny review I came across recently on Amazon, and I wanted to share it with you. Uh, it was actually an actual uh, review listed by an actual human being on Amazon for a bottle of glitter, like the stuff you'd use for arts and crafts. Uh, I thought you guys would enjoy this. This is what it says. This is the actual review. So I wake up in the middle of the night in my two-bedroom apartment, and there's a homeless guy asleep on my couch. My roommate has a big heart but terrible judgment, and this is the second time he let a stranger off the street just stroll in and pass out. Great. You're probably wondering, what does this have to do with my arts and crafting? <laughs> well, I bought this product and I proceeded to cover everything my roommate owns in glitter. Every t-shirt, every book, every pair of shoes, his bed, I covered his entire life in glitter. He will have glitter in every crevice of his existence until he dies. Did some track out all over my apartment? Yes. Yes. Does the carpet look like a Care Bear had an accident all over it? Yes. Did he even threaten to kill me? Sure. But will he ever let another stranger sleep on our couch in the night? No. Will I ever have to worry about a random guy off the street murdering me in the night? No. All that security for just $12.44. <laughs> Unbelievable, staggering value. Cannot recommend enough. That was a real review. Isn't that funny? Uh, there were some other ones, but they weren't appropriate for church, so I didn't read those, okay? <laughs> But why is it that we research? Why is it we read those reviews? We want to be sure before we buy in that what we're buying into is legitimate, don't we? And if you remember back to when we started our series in the Gospel of John, that was actually John's purpose statement in writing this book. He wrote this account of Jesus' life so that we might believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he was the Messiah, that he was God in the flesh come into the world. And so he wants to give us the pieces that we need to be able to buy into Jesus and who he is and believe in him. And I've already told you this many times throughout the series, but it's the most important decision you'll ever make in this life. And so as we dig back into chapter 10 this week, Pastor Chad did a great job covering the first half. We're going to cover the second half of chapter 10 today. So go ahead to John chapter 10, verse 22 is where we're going to pick up. And let's see what John has to say today about us buying into Jesus as he picks up this conversation of Jesus being the good shepherd. Look at verse 22. I'll put it on the screens here behind me. John 10 and verse 22. It says, Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. Now, roughly two to three months have passed since the uh, Festival of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. Remember that one? We talked about that one for a few weeks. That was the one where it was like the big giant camp out where everybody comes to Jerusalem. They light the big uh, pillar lamps there in the temple courtyards, all that stuff, the water ceremony. Roughly two to three months have passed between that festival and the Festival of ded Dedication here. Um, a lot of writers and theologians think that actually between verse 21 and 22, uh, 21 is the fall of the year and 22 is the winter. So two to three months have passed. And this is yet another festival that uh, the Jewish people took part in every year, but it was actually not a festival or a feast prescribed by God in the Old Testament. The Feast of Tabernacles was one of those, and Passover and some of the others were ones that were prescribed by God. This was actually not one prescribed by God, though it was a fine enough festival, and we're going to talk about what it was and what it was about. It was actually, it only been in practice just under 200 years, and what they call the Festival of Dedication is what we know today as Hanukkah. Everyone say Hanukkah. Okay, put on your yarmulke, it's time for Hanukkah, so much Hanukkah to celebrate Hanukkah. Yeah, you Adam Sandler fans, you get that one, okay? Same one, Festival of Lights, okay, that's what it is. 
But whereas the festival of tabernacles was one where everyone had to gather at the temple in Jerusalem and they lit these big lamps, the uh, Hanukkah or the, the festival of dedication was one that could actually be celebrated in your home with candles and lamps within your home. So you actually didn't have to travel to Jerusalem unless you just wanted to, okay? But this is what they're celebrating here. This was a celebration of the rededication of the temple that took place in the intertestamental period. I know that's like a $30 word right there in the right out of the gate, okay? But basically between the end of the Old Testament, Malachi, the last verse in Malachi, and the first verses we read in the New Testament, there was about 400 years where we heard nothing from God verbally, okay? There was nothing written down or recorded that God spoke to us in the scriptures in that 400-year period. Within that period is when this festival crept up, okay? This is when it took place. It's important for us to know. Now, Jewish historians actually write a lot about this festival and what it meant and where it originated. And basically what it was is in 175 B.C., okay? If you're like me, I get confused when I see the B.C. A.D. thing. Here's what you need to know, okay? It was 175 years before Jesus came on the scene is when this happened, okay? In 175 B.C., there was an evil Syrian king. His name was Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes. Strange name, okay? He ruled over the Jews. And he actually gave himself part of that name. The Epiphanies part of that, he gave it to himself. And what it means is God made manifest, which essentially he was saying, I am God in the flesh. So this dude is an Old Testament picture of the Antichrist that's going to come on the scene in Revelation. You know, that guy who sets himself up as God. This is what this guy tries to do here in this intertestamental period before Jesus comes on the scene. He's, he's coming down on the Jews. And I'll just say this. If you have to give yourself a nickname, like, you're, you're kind of a loser. Just saying that, all right? You know, like, nicknames are supposed to be the result of hazing in college or, like, your good friends knowing a good attribute about you and then naming you that. Like, my friends call me good looking. Like, I, I get that one, you know? Like, I, 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 I resonate with that. I, I appreciate it. But I, I wouldn't make that up for myself. You know, that's just how it works. He gives himself this nickname, and he was this wicked, wicked ruler. I mean, you've, you heard me talk about Nero and some of these other rulers before. This guy was right on their level. He persecuted the Jews. He hated them. He killed many of them. He used many of them uh, in, in means of slavery. Um, he forbade the Jews to read or possess the Old Testament scriptures. He forbade them to keep the Sabbath. He forbade them to circumcise their children. All these things that were important parts of their worship of God, he would not allow them to do. In fact, it was said that there were two women that went up against uh, Antiochus and said, we're going to circumcise our young boys anyway, our babies anyway. Antiochus actually took their baby murdered them in front of them, tied the baby's bodies around the mother's necks and paraded them through Jerusalem as a show of his power. They, he led them to the corner of the temple and threw them off to fall to their death in the valley below. I mean, this is the kind of evil this guy would do, just heartless, ruthless, hated the Jews and hated God. And that was just part of his tyrannical rule. Okay? This guy, his biggest offense, and this is where I'm going with this, was his uh, desecration of the temple. His desecration of the temple. He installed a statue of the false god Zeus in the temple that God had designed for himself. Okay? Um, he actually even made an image of himself. Like he made a statue of himself and put it in there. Again, this guy's giving himself a nickname. He's making statues of himself. If either of those are patterns in your life, you may need to get some help, all right? You are a narcissist. This is what this guy was, okay? He makes an idol of himself, and then he takes it a step further, and he sacrifices a pig on the altar in the temple, okay? If you know anything about Jewish culture and the Jewish law, pigs were incredibly unclean. Like this is a detestable, offensive act, okay? This is like slapping a Duke Blue Devils bumper sticker on a North Carolina Tar Heel fan's bumper, okay? I, I know what a good Tar Heel fan, but, you know, this, this and, I, and I say that jokingly, but this was seriously an incredible, incredible offensive thing to the Jewish people, and they felt an offense to a holy God, okay? So they were mad, as you can imagine. They were angry, they were under oppression, and there's a guy named Judas Maccabeus that comes on the scene, and you might have even heard of the term before, Maccabeans, that's where they're named from, this guy, okay? Judas Maccabeus was their hero. His name was Judas the Hammer, and he did not give himself that name, all right? Someone else endowed him with that. You've heard of M.C. Hammer, this is J.M. Hammer, all right? MC Hammer was the parachute pants and bad music in the early 90s. This guy was armor, and like, a, a, you know, he comes in and he, he has a revolution against this guy. But Judas, along with his ragtag army in the countryside, come in, and they actually conquered uh, Antiochus. They overthrew him, and they took back Jerusalem. He goes in, and he removes the idols from the temple. He goes in, they actually uh, ritually purify the temple, and he reconsecrates, and he re 
dedicates the temple back to God. There's where they get the name from, the festival of dedication. They're rededicating it back. And so this is what they're celebrating in this festival. It was a great thing. There was a desire, though, and take note of this. There was a desire in the people here at this festival to not only celebrate the possession, again, of their temple, but to celebrate and lift up the power of their hero, Judas the Hammer. And I was thinking about this over the past couple of weeks as I was preparing this message, and the desire that they had to lift up this hero is still alive and well today in our hearts, isn't it? You know, there's something hardwired in us as human beings that wants to lift up a hero. We long for a powerful person, a powerful entity to look up to, to lift up, and to admire. Um, This is why in our culture we're so drawn to celebrities. We're so drawn drawn to professional athletes because we're on this hunt for glory. Everyone say glory. We're on this hunt for it, and really what we're on the hunt for is something or someone to worship, to make much of. And there's something just wired within us that wants this. Um, I was at the movie theater in Wichita last weekend seeing a movie with my family. And uh, we've actually been in Wichita the last two weekends, so we've been keeping the road quite hot between here and there. But we were there seeing the new Jurassic World movie. Uh, I I don't know about you. I I think there's something uh, deeply moving and meaningful um, about watching people get eaten by dinosaurs. I think it's great, you know? Um, I, I don't know if you feel the same way, but I do, and we enjoy those. So we're over there watching it. But what got my attention was not the movie itself. It was the hour of previews before the movie, Right? So we get there on time. I'm like, I like to be there on time. And actually, it was one of those places where you can reserve your seat. I'd never been to one of those before. It had like the recliners and they vibrated and stuff. Like with the movie, it was incredible. Like I felt like I was being eaten by a dinosaur a couple of times. But we get there, you know, early. We're ready to go. We got our popcorn. We're ready to go. And then it was like 30 minutes of previews. But what struck me in the previews is just about every single one of those previews was about some superhero or some god with a little G that we were celebrating in our culture. Yeah, Thor, the god of thunder, right? I'm not, I'm not knocking your Marvel movies. Go watch your Marvel movie if you enjoy that. I'm not saying anything's wrong with it. But Thor and uh, some other guy named Black Adam, there was some movie about this all-powerful genie, and it was not Aladdin, trust me, okay? But, but as I was watching and I was thinking to myself, I'm like, this is just like uncovering what's actually in the souls of every human being, that hardwiring, that we want to look at someone greater than us. We want to look to someone stronger than us that can protect us or provide for us or prevent evil in our lives. There's something that God has designed in every human being that desires that, and we see it in our culture now, and we see it in the culture here at this festival of dedication. And so that's what they're celebrating here in chapter 10. But what struck me as I was reading this is that They're here admiring this mortal earthly hero, Judas the Hammer, all the while Jesus, the God of the universe in human flesh, is standing before them saying, look guys, you're here to honor this guy who's dead and gone and in the ground, and I am here standing in front of you. I'm the hero that you've been longing for. I'm the hero that your heart, your deepest desire wants to follow. I am that guy. And he steps onto the scene very much the way he did at the Feast of the Tabernacles when he said, you guys are impressed with these temple lights. They're pretty amazing, these massive 75-foot structures. Look, I'm the light of the world. You guys are impressed with this water and this water ceremony. He says, I'm the living water. He's doing the same thing here again at this festival. You guys are looking to an earthly hero. I'm here as the true hero. Come to take away the sins of the world. If you guys are with me, say yes. The other thing I note here before we move on is that John mentions here to us that it is winter. Okay? And and I believe it's not only just winter outside, though we do know that it's the season in which this takes place, but it's winter inside as well. I think this is symbolic. If we've learned anything about John, our friend to this point, he loves symbolism, right? He likes to talk about symbolism. He's actually the guy that wrote Revelation, loves symbolism. And I think what he's describing here is not just the weather on the outside, but the hearts of many of the people on the inside. The hearts of the people there in Jerusalem where he's teaching in this last moment of public teaching ministry that Jesus has before he would go to the cross in the spring. He's here and these people are so cold and they're so hard and they're so unwilling to receive the seed of the gospel that I believe what he's really describing here is their hearts. In fact, in the verses we're going to read here, and we've already gotten to a couple, but 18 of these 21 verses in the second half of this chapter are about the unbelief of the Jewish people. These are unbelieving, hard people that have dug their heels in in their unbelief. So that's the setting. Look at verse 24. Let's keep moving here. Verse 24. The Jews who were there gathered around him saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? 
If you are the Messiah, then tell us plainly. So what they're doing here is they're ganging up on him. Okay, imagine recess back in elementary school where everyone like circles around the kid and everybody starts yelling, fight, fight. This is what's happening here. So don't, don't take the emotion in, in, from the scene here. This is what's happening. This is not like a calm thing, all right? So they come around him. They circle around him as he's walking back in Solomon's portico, as it said a moment ago on Solomon's porch. And they say, if you, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? Um, why don't you tell us plainly who you are? Say it explicitly who you say to be. This is actually the same language that Jesus' brothers told him when they told him to go up to the Festival of Tabernacles a few chapters back. They said, you need to go up there and disclose yourself to the people. Go tell them exactly who you say you are. If you want to gain this following, this is your chance. It's the same word they use here of this. Here's the deal, though. These guys were lying, okay? They weren't in suspense at all. Do you know what suspense is? Okay? Suspense is uh, an excited uncertainty, excited uncertainty like you're sitting on the edge of your seat because what's going to happen or be said next could change something about you in a big way okay uh, suspense is like you know watching your favorite basketball team in the national championship blow a 15 point first half lead and then limp along in the second half just closely enough to make you think you've got a chance to win while you watch them circle the drain but I'm not bitter okay I'm not bitter at all that's suspense had I won had we won that game that would have changed my life all right I would have bragging rights in this town for years, all right? But now I've just got to, like, drop my head in shame because we lost. These guys aren't in suspense at all, and I can tell you why. One, they've already asked him this question three other times leading up to this moment anyway. So they're not in suspense about this. And the other reason is this. This is important. They're not trying to understand Jesus. They're trying to trap Jesus with this question. They're not trying to understand so they can believe. They're trying to uh, trap him so they can attack him. And what they do is they attempt to disguise their unbelief um, as doubt. Okay? And there's a big difference, even though those words sound very similar. There's a big difference between unbelief and doubt. Listen, all of us have doubts from time to time, don't we? I, I'm just being honest with you. There are things I doubt about myself. The things I doubt within our family. The things I doubt within our country. There, there's things I doubt, and I, I think you'd be honest with me. I, I hope you'd be honest with me about this. There's things we doubt about our faith. Do you ever have doubts about God? I mean, I, I feel like if you can't admit that, you're probably lying to yourself. We all have doubts, but here's the key difference. I'd encourage you to write this down. The difference between doubts and unbeliefs is this. Doubt looks for answers. Unbelief looks for excuses. Doubt looks for answers because they want to understand and you want to lean in and dig in further in your faith. Unbelief looks for excuses to excuse your actions so you can be rid of faith. Are y'all with me? And this is what these guys are doing here. They're looking for excuses. They're looking for Jesus to say something they could use to trap him, which would excuse them from having to deal with what Jesus was teaching and with what Jesus was doing because it was convicting to them. This is them wanting to remain blind. Do you remember a couple weeks ago when we talked about Jesus being the light of the world? What does he do as the light of the world? He shows us our blindness. The light reveals our blindness. This is them wanting to remain blind because if they can get Jesus to say out loud explicitly that he's the Messiah, then according to their law, they can stone him and they won't have to deal with him anymore. And this is like the easy out. If we can get him to say, I am the Messiah, people will either think he's crazy uh, we can stone him. Whatever. Either way, we don't have to deal with him anymore. They're not truly looking to understand. They are asking questions, looking for support to excuse their unbelief, not genuinely looking for answers from Jesus. They've made up their minds already, and they're looking for a way to attack, not to truly believe. Um, this is like parents in the room. It's Father's Day today, right? Let's talk about parents and kids for a minute. This is like when you know your kids have done something wrong or not done what you asked. Like you know the facts and you go to them and question them to make a point. Have you ever done this, parents? I do this all the time. Like, I mean, we're, I'm a pastor. This stuff never happens in my house. You know what I mean? Like we're, we, we float down the stairs in white robes in the morning and there's like the hallelujah chorus, that whole thing. Now, now has it ever happened to you that maybe you ask, let's just make one up. Uh, okay. You, you ask your kids to fold the clothes, do the laundry, right? To fold the clothes and put them away. And you put a big load of laundry on the bed. And you go in there and the clothes are not on the bed. So you think, wow, my child's obedient. Like I really wanted them to be. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You know what I mean? But then you lift up the bed skirt and you look under the bed. And you look under there and you're like, uh, that's not where those clothes go. And so you know what your child has done. They have not folded the clothes, though they are appearing as if they have folded the clothes. And so you go to your, let's just say your oldest child. Let's just make that up, okay? <laughs> and you say, did you fold all the clothes? Well, do I know the answer to that question already? 
Have I made my mind up about my position on the laundry? Okay. Uh, did you fold all the clothes? And they go, and she goes, yes, like a liar. You know what I mean? <laughs> a little sinner. And I say, whoa, whoa, whoa. You say, you're telling me you folded all the clothes. And she goes, yes. Dad tip for this morning, if your kids ever respond and their statement sounds more like a question than a statement, they're lying, all right? We can go home right there. Father's Day, happy Father's Day 2022. And you go, so you're telling me the, the, the clothes were folded. Yes, they were. Look under the bed skirt and then you pull it back like you're like this great investigative detective and you crush them, right? What are you doing? You're trying to make a point. I'm not trying to understand. I'm not asking questions so that I can understand what she did or how she did it or why. No, I know I've made my mind up already, and I just want to attack or make a point. It will make that sound a little calmer than what it is. That's what these guys are doing here. They don't want to believe. They have decided that they are not going to believe in Jesus because they love their sin more than they love the light, and they're asking questions to indict him so they can attack him and stone him so they no longer have to deal with him. If you are with me, say yes. And what's interesting about it is that they asked the right question. It was actually a really good question. Are you the Messiah? That's a a fair enough question if it came with the right motivation. They asked the right question. They asked it to the right person. He's going to give them the right answer. And yet in the end, they still choose not to believe. Look at Jesus' response, verse 25. Jesus answered, I did tell you because he did. He told them in a matter of ways. Uh, Oftentimes, his statements would be a little bit veiled, slightly veiled. I mean, you think maybe in some of the other Gospels how Jesus taught in parables. I don't have time to dig into that too much. But there was a way in which Jesus taught and made statements so that people wouldn't write him off as a lunatic or a crazy person. Just like if someone today were to stand up here and say, I am God in the flesh, you would think that person's nuts. Let's run them down to the hospital. Okay? He wouldn't say it necessarily as explicitly in that way on purpose because he didn't want to be written off and then he didn't want to be stoned as well because they would easily, like what they're trying to do here, trap him in his words and then stone him. Okay? But he did tell them. Okay? He made it very clear without explicitly stating it that he was God. So he says, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify about me. He says, I did tell you, and I did show you. He says, guys, do you not remember the blind guy? Do you not remember the blind man? I mean, you remember that whole thing? I spit on the ground, I made mud, I got all up in his personal space, and I put mud in his face and healed him from his blindness. No one's ever done that in the history of the world. Look at my works. I am from the Father. I am the one you've been looking for. He says, I did tell you. You didn't believe The works I do in my Father's name testify about me as well. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. And then he goes on to describe the sheep a little bit in verse 27. Look what he says about the sheep. He says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Isn't it amazing to think that the God of the universe knows you? Like, You know, sometimes we feel a little unknown. Sometimes I don't know about you. I I feel this way sometimes. Like I go unnoticed. I feel like, you know, what what have I really accomplished in this life? Nobody cares who I am or what I've done. I'm sure that you feel the same way at times. But to know that the God of the universe knows you and he knows your specific need right now, right where you sit. And as your good, loving shepherd, he wants to lead you to green pastures. He wants to lead you to a place of health and of life. And as Pastor Chad preached last week, a place of that abundant life. And he says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Uh, In the West, we drive sheep, okay? And generally in the West, we drive uh, cattle and such. We're in cattle country. I mean, unless it's like dairy cows or something, you don't necessarily drive them. But overall, we drive sheep. It's, it's It's kind of under oppression or under pressure that we push and guide herds of livestock is how we do that here in the West. In the East, that's not how they do it. In the east, they lead the, 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 the livestock. They lead the sheep with their voice. Oftentimes, a, a shepherd will have a very specific call, a sound or a whistle that he'll make with his voice. And even though there may be multiple flocks of sheep all intermingled together grazing, when he makes that call, the, his sheep know his voice, and they come out and they follow him out without him having to, to crack a whip and lead them where they want to go. I think it's interesting that's how Jesus describes his followers, that they're, they're not listening to attack or reject like the religious Jews were here that circled around him. They're listening so that they can follow and they obey. Is that true of your life? Are you listening to the voice of God in your life today? 
Like, I mean, I, I know you hear preaching and stuff on Sunday when you're here on Sunday, but day to day, or have you learned to tune your ear to the voice of God? And I'm not talking about something audible, though. If God wants to do that, he's God. He can do what he wants to do. But generally, God speaks to us through his word, whether that's preaching like what we're doing right now. Maybe that's your quiet time at home. He, he does it through friends, godly friends that can guide you in the right direction. He does it through the Holy Spirit that indwells us as believers. He guides us with his voice. Have you learned to listen to his voice? Are you sensitive to the leading that God has in your life, the voice of Jesus in your life? I hear people say all the time, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. I go to church. I'm a Christian. I go to church. And what I want to say is the, the true proof of that statement that you are truly a Christian, that you are a Jesus follower is are you following his voice in your life? And I don't know who needs to hear that this morning or what area you've been resisting God's voice in your life. But Jesus says one of the key marks of discipleship, one of the key marks of being one of his sheep is that you know his voice, you listen to his voice, and you follow his voice. Are y'all with me? He said, listen to my voice. He said, my sheep listen to me. You unbelieving Jews, the one circle around him, he said, you guys aren't listening. You're listening to attack. You don't truly know my voice the way my sheep know my voice. Look what he says in verse 28. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. See, Jesus' treatment of the sheep as the good shepherd is much different than the religious leaders and the way they led the sheep. Uh, last week, we talked about how that the, 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 uh, the religious leaders were described as thieves and robbers. Okay, that's how John describes them. Thieves and or Jesus does. Uh, thieves and robbers. See, the religious leaders... They would use the sheep for their own good. They would look for ways in which they could take things from the sheep. It was their own agenda, their own reputation, okay? They were looking for ways to uh, basically abuse and use the sheep to get what they want. And Jesus is saying, look, I'm different than those guys. I'm the good shepherd. I actually give. I don't take, but I give and I lay myself down for the good of the sheep. That's completely opposite to the way the religious leaders operated. Well, what is it that he gives them? I mean, he's pretty clear in here. He says, I give them, what's the next two words? Eternal life. He says, I give them eternal life. That's one of many things that he gives us. Uh, and you say, well, wait a minute. You mean he gives us eternal life? I mean, I thought I had to earn my salvation. I, I thought I had to do enough good things. I thought there was going to be a day when I, get, when I die and I stand before God and he's going to have this big giant scale and he's going to weigh my good deeds versus my bad deeds. And if my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds and I'm getting in, I thought that's how it worked. I thought I had to earn it. No, no, no. Do not miss the simplicity and the gravity of what he's saying here. I give them eternal life. Everything about your salvation has been purchased and accomplished by way of Jesus Christ on the cross. He has paid it all by his sacrifice. It is nothing on your merit. It is nothing on your works. There is not enough good things you can do in this life to outweigh the sin in your life and in your heart. The only way to be saved is through the gift of eternal life that Jesus offers us. And all we have to do is receive it. Again, this is John's whole point of this, of this book, this gospel, is that you might believe and receive that gospel that Jesus has purchased and provided for you. There is nothing that you can do to earn it. He says, I am a good shepherd, so I don't take. I give them eternal life. But then it gets even better. He says, and then they'll never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. He says, that's not all. He says, not only. You don't do anything to earn eternal life, but you don't do anything to keep your eternal life either. You and I don't do anything to earn our eternal life, and you don't do anything to keep it either. He said, they'll never perish, and no one's going to snatch them out of my hand. He says, no one, not the thief, not the wolf, not the robber, not even your own bad deeds or your bad motivations or your sin can pluck you out of God's hand, out of Jesus Christ's hand. That's a comforting truth, isn't it, this morning? See, whenever we accept Christ as our personal Savior, you are forgiven of past sin, present sin, in future sin. That doesn't mean we're not going to mess up. It doesn't mean there's things you shouldn't con You should confess. Along with, I confess sins every day to the Lord. I, I'm not perfect. And those of you who know me well know that. But, but we are forgiven of those and our position in Christ does not change. Our position in the hand of Jesus does not change because of something you do or don't do after you have believed in Jesus Christ. That's a great comforting truth today. Your eternal life is not in your hands. It is in Jesus' hands. Amen. And then he doubles down in verse 29. Look what he says in verse 29. Not only are you in Jesus' hand, he says, My Father who's given them to me is greater than all. God is greater than any being in the universe. He says he's greater than everybody, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. So not only are you in Jesus' hand, you are in God's hand. And I would tell you that's because they are one and the same. And let me ask you a question that is not a trick question at all right now. Can anyone steal from God? 
Anyone. Is there any thief cunning enough to steal from God the Father? No. Is there any wolf strong enough to steal from God the Father? No. Is there any robber cunning or subtle or crafty enough to steal from God the Father? No. He says your salvation, your eternal life, once you place your faith in Jesus, it is eternally secure, not only in the hand of Jesus, but in the hand of the Father, and no one can snatch you out of either of their hands. See, your salvation has nothing to do with how tightly you hold on to him, and it has everything to do with how tightly he holds on to you. That's the God we serve, and that's the eternal life that he gives us. That's the security that he gives us. I don't know if you thought about this yet, but I find it pretty interesting here that this festival is about the celebration of this man, Judas Maccabeus, right, Judas the Hammer, that comes in and gives security back to the Jewish people by giving them their temple back. Have you thought about this? The, the whole idea is they, they drew a lot of security and identity from their religious customs, okay? What they did in the temple, that whole temple system was a big part of their life. It wasn't just like, you know, a lot of Americans today, it's like church is something we do on Sunday, and then we have life the rest of the week, which is not good, but that's the way a lot of us operate sometimes. It was a part of everything that they did. And so by Judas the hammer coming in, taking over Antiochus Epiphanes and giving them their temple back, he gave them a sense of security by restoring that temple and that temple system. And what I think is so fascinating is that Jesus stands here in front of them and says, look, I am the one sent from God. I've, I've come here to give you a greater security than that temple building can ever give you. See, the temple could be taken away, as they would soon find out. Not even 40 years later, Rome would come in and destroy that temple that they were celebrating that Judas had given back to them. And Jesus says, I am here to give you an eternal security, eternal life that can't be taken away, a position, an identity that can't be taken away no matter what goes on on the outside. I'm here to give you that kind of security, and it can never be destroyed or removed. Interesting, isn't it? Then... He says, verse 30, very, about as explicitly as he stated it so far. He says, you guys want me to explain who I am? He says, I and the Father are one. Again, notice he didn't say, I am the Messiah. He's very careful with the language that he used, but he says, I and the Father are one. Now, he is claiming divinity here. He's claiming to be God, for sure. This means that Jesus and the Father, God, are one in essence and nature, distinct in person, Okay, individual persons, but, but one in essence in nature. Now, we know this because of the structure of the, the original language here. I won't bore you with all the details of that, okay? i got to get you dad's home so you can get your foot rubs from the family today for Father's Day. Okay, I won't give you all the details. But the structure of the, of the Greek underneath this, it actually lends itself to understanding he's claiming to be God. The other reason that we know he's claiming to be God here is because in a minute they're going to try to stone him for what he just said. Okay, this is a common theme that we're seeing. But not only, listen to this, not only are Jesus and the Father one in nature as part of the Trinity, they're perfectly one in action and in mission. So they're distinct in person, but they're one in their purpose is a great way to think about it. Distinct in person, but one in purpose. What you see in Jesus is a direct reflection of the Father. Jesus identifies himself here clearly with the power, the love, the actions, the plans, and the mission of God in the world. He says, what I'm doing is what the Father would be doing if he were here with me or in my place. And I think it's interesting here that later on in chapter 17, uh, John is actually going to talk about uh, Jesus' high priestly prayer is what he calls it in chapter 17. And uh, Jesus is actually going to pray that believers, you and I, that, that have trusted Christ, would be one as uh, he and the Father are one. Now, he's not talking about us becoming part of the Trinity. That's not what he's talking about. What's, what's he mean? He's talking about us as believers being one in mission and in action, just like the Father and the Son are one in mission and in action. See, how, how is it that we do that as a church? I think it's very simple. We've talked about this since the beginning of the year. It, when we are committed wholeheartedly to the Great Commission, the mission of Jesus that he left with us here on the planet, the continuation of the mission that Jesus came to complete by going to a cross, when we are committed fully to the Great Commission by being a church where everyone is for the one, where we do anything short of sin to reach lost people in our community, where we do everything in our power to reach lost people, that's when we are operating like the Father and the Son. That's what Jesus is saying here. When everyone is for the one, you know what it does? It's a really beautiful thing. When we are laser focused on the mission of being for the one, just like Jesus was here, when we're laser focused, it takes care of a lot of complaining. It takes care of a lot of criticism. It takes care of a lot of preferential ideas that people like willingly throw out, sometimes more willingly than I wish they would. 
And see, when we take our, our carts or our wagons and we turn them from facing one another and we face them out towards the world and the mission that God's called us to complete as a church, that's when we are one like Jesus and the Father are one. And that's when we'll reach our one here in our city and see many lost people be saved. Are you all with me? Everyone for the one. That's what Jesus is talking about here. He and the Father are one, not only in, in, in essence and nature, but they're one in their mission, in their purpose, and in action. And we should be the same. Look at verse 31. Again, his Jewish opponents, though, they picked up stones to stone him. Remember, I said they, they understood what he was saying. They knew that he was claiming to be God. But Jesus said to them, I, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? I mean, I've only done good things. I've healed people. I've taught. I, you know, I, I've helped people. I've been kind. I've been compassionate. Like, what are you stoning me for? In verse 33, we're not stoning you for any good work, they replied. We're stoning you for blasphemy because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Isn't it curious that they're angry right here because what they see in front of them is a man trying to make himself God, and they're upset about it. When in fact, who's standing in front of them is the God who came down from heaven and made himself man to die for the sins of the world. They completely misinterpret. Their unbelief has blinded them to who is standing right in front of them. He says, I'm God come in the flesh. I'm not making myself equal with God. I'm God who made myself a man to come down here and take care of your mess, is what he's telling them. But the other thing I'd say here that's interesting as well, did you notice something different that Jesus does here when they take up stones to stone him? What has he done every other time when they take up stones to stone him? He slips out the side door, doesn't he? He's like, oh, all right, did enough here, better get out of here before they take me out early. That was the plan. And again, he's following the will of the Father. It's interesting to me here that in his last public teaching opportunity in his public ministry, that instead of slipping away, the risk that he takes by staying there and continuing to try to reason to get these hard-hearted, winter-hearted religious people to believe. What a glimpse we have of Jesus' heart in this for the lost. These religious Jews were terrible to Jesus. You've heard me tell all the things, so I won't do it all again right now. They've been terrible to him. They've said terrible things about him. They've tried to kill him. They've maligned his character. They've tried to discredit him. All these evil things that they've done to him, and yet they're about to stone him. And instead of Jesus slipping away, he stays and tries to reason with them because he wants to see them believe. If that doesn't show you the heart of Jesus Christ for you, his desire for you to believe and be saved, I don't know what will. And he sticks around. And he says, guys, believe. Listen to me. Believe. He doesn't slip off. And he gives them a great piece of logic here in verse 34. Look what he says. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? That's the Old Testament. Is it not written in your law that I've said you are gods with a little g? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be set aside or broken, what about the one whom the Father set apart, me, as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of, of blasphemy because I said I am God's son? Now, Jesus is doing a little bit of like beating them at their own game here. He says, you guys want to, you're so tied to your Old Testament and the law. He says, you want to go there? Let's go there. I know my Old Testament. Jesus knew it perfectly. And what he's referencing here, the phrase, you'll notice it's in quotes in your Bible. Uh, what he's referencing here is Psalm 82. Uh, Psalm 82 is a pretty obscure not well-known uh, psalm, okay? Like, you're not going to find this on a coffee mug or on Hobby Lobby art, okay? You're not finding it, okay? It's not going to be on there. What the psalm is talking about, it specifically is in verse 6. It's about God condemning or God judging Israel's leaders, and he calls them, instead of calling them leaders, he calls them gods with a little g, okay? And he's condemning them because they're not dealing justly with the weak, the orphans, and the widows. And so Jesus' line of reasoning here is brilliant. He says, I'm going to use your Old Testament against you right now, religious people. He says, so, so you're telling me that if leaders, bad leaders in the Old Testament can be called gods with a little g because they're extensions of God's authority to the people, okay? Why can't I be called the son of God? Why is it blasphemy if I'm called the son of God? I'm here fulfilling the purposes of God. I'm here fulfilling the purposes and the actions of God. I'm doing only that which God can do, and I'm representing him. Why can't I be called the son of God? I will tell you this, too. We don't have time to dig in too far here. This is probably a whole other message for another day. But I think even this idea of coming underneath God's authority here by way of the leaders he puts in place is really important for us as Christians. See, it's, it's easy for us to blast presidents and other political leaders and church leaders and community leaders and et cetera, et cetera. 
Let me tell you something, and I don't have time to preach a whole sermon here, but there is blessing when you submit yourself to God-ordained leadership. There just is. Even when you don't agree with them, even when gas costs you $80 a gallon, praise the Lord, that's all you can say, right? Like, but, but there is something to coming underneath God-ordained leadership because Paul tells us in Romans that leadership positions are extensions of God's rule. This is what Jesus is talking about here in Psalm 82 when he, when he quotes this. These guys were extensions of God's rule, and they were called gods with a little g because of that. He says, why can't I be called the son of God? I'm only doing that which God can do, and I'm representing him fully. And they were like, shoot, he got us again. All right, what do we got next? And so they pull out their playbook, right? Verse 37. He says, don't believe me unless I do the works of my father. He says, if I can't back up my words with these works or miracles or signs, he says, then don't believe me. Do you see the pleading he's doing here with these people to try to get them to believe? Instead of slipping off and trying to just protect himself, he stays and he risks it to get these people to believe, to give them one last opportunity to place their faith in Jesus. He says, but if I do them, even though you don't believe me and my words, he says, believe the works the miracles that I do, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me. He says, try and understand. He, Jesus knew exactly what they were doing, trying to trap him, right? They were, they were unbelieving and trying to find excuses. He says, look, just try to understand for a minute. Look at what I've come to say and look at what I've come to do. He says, you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am the Father. Again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. So even after Jesus' final plea for them to believe, they hold on to their sin and they reject the Savior. And then verse 40, and Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days, and there he stayed. Now he's talking about John the Baptist there, which he'll go into detail. So to get the timeline right here in the spring, we're in the winter here. In the spring, very soon, Jesus would give his life for the sins of the world on the cross But before he does, he returns to the place where John the Baptist prepared the way for the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. And now that public ministry is drawing to a close. And look at what happens down at the river that didn't happen at the temple. Verse 41. And many people came to him there at the river. They said, though John never performed a sign, John the Baptist, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. What a contrast between the river and the temple, right? What a contrast, the the belief that took place at the Jordan while there was unbelief and hardness in Jerusalem. These men and women that, that knew the law inside and out there in Jerusalem rejected him. And yet these people here at the river Jordan come to him and they believe. And I think it's interesting what they say about John the Baptist here. So he never did a, he signed, he never performed a sign. There was no miracles. There was nothing showy about John's ministry at all. John the Baptist was not about making a name for himself. He wasn't about being pretentious. He wasn't about fame. He wasn't about status or show. He was a faithful witness that put the spotlight on Jesus and Jesus alone. And I think there's a great key to faith in that. John Piper says it like this. He says, faith flourishes when the spotlight and attention is placed on Jesus alone. Think about that for a minute. Faith flourishes when the spotlight and attention is placed on Jesus alone. Let me tell you something. That's what we try to do here every single week at Bible Christian Church. See, I could get up here and I could give you three life hacks to make your marriage better. And I'm going to give you practical application. You hear it throughout the messages. But I could get up here and only give you three life hacks to make your marriage better. And that might work for a week. Okay, let's just be real. I can give you four life hacks to make you be a better parent and three life hacks to make you a better neighbor. Okay? Stop snooping through the fence. That's, that's number one on that list, okay? I can do that. But what are those things at the end of the day if they're, if they're disconnected from Jesus and the person of Jesus? They're just shallow ideas and shallow thoughts and shallow rules, just like the religious people here were following that didn't get them any closer to Jesus and didn't give them the abundant life that Jesus came to offer them. See, that they're shallow ideas that put the focus on you and what you can do to fix yourself. Our job and my job, I take it seriously every single week, is to point you to Jesus Christ. Because when you fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, so much of the rest of life takes care of itself, doesn't it? So I can give you three life hacks for this and four life hacks for that. Look, if you want that mess, go go watch a TED Talk. Okay, they're great for that. 
But here every single week, we're going to point your focus to Jesus Christ because he is the only one. He is the only good shepherd that can change your life and heal your marriage and heal your kids and heal your career and your family mess you got going on. It is when we fix our eyes on who Jesus is and what he came to do. That's a great place to say amen. And that's our goal every single week. And just like John here, my desire is for every single one of you. If you've never believed, I want you to believe for the first time ever. And if you have believed, I want you to believe more deeply than ever. That's John's desire for us throughout this gospel. That was John the Baptist's desire as he pointed people to the person of Jesus Christ. And just like both those Johns, I want you to believe in Jesus today. Do me a favor. Close your Bible and just look right here at me for just a moment. Close your Bible. Here's the deal you've got to realize about this, this thing of belief. You are believing in something today. Did you realize this? You are placing your faith in something or someone. Listen, you are buying into something today. It is either a person, it is a something, it is some system. I don't know what it is for you personally. But you are buying into something with your life. You and I as human beings don't have an option not to believe. Even what we've been describing here as unbelief in these religious people, really what it is is them choosing to believe in something different than Jesus. Their unbelief in Jesus was belief in something else. They thought they knew better than Jesus. They thought they could make themselves better apart from Jesus, right? At the end of the day, they're believing in something. We don't have a choice not to believe. And you and I are the very same today as the religious people Jesus interacts with here. You are buying into something with your life. Listen to this line closely. Do not miss this. You are entrusting yourself and your life to something today to take care of you, to provide for you, to guide you, to protect you, and to fulfill you. That sounds a lot like a shepherd, doesn't it? That description sounds a lot like the role of a shepherd, which is exactly what Jesus is offering to be today through this passage in John 10. See, it, it sounds like what each of us in this life are looking for in life is a good shepherd to do all those things that I just listed out for you. We're looking for a good shepherd to follow, and we're looking for a good shepherd that we can count on no matter the situation. One that's not going to cut and run when things get hard. One that's going to lack the power or ability to fix a situation when we come upon it. Let me tell you this today. There is only one shepherd you can follow that can follow through. There is only one shepherd you can follow that can follow through. Listen, there are a lot of bad shepherds out there clamoring for your attention, clamoring for your worship, clamoring for you to follow them. Money, religion, work, appearance, sex, sports, career, comfort, fame, status. They'll all stand on the corner and scream, follow me and I'll take care of you. Follow me and I'll provide for you. Follow me and I'll protect you. Follow me and I'll fulfill you. Follow me. They can't do it. They were never designed to follow through as shepherds, good shepherds of your life. Only Jesus Christ can hold that seat. Amen? He is the only shepherd worth following. He's the only shepherd you can follow that can follow through. There's only one good shepherd. And actually, the psalmist writes about it in Psalm 23. Can I read this to you as we close? I'm going to put it on the screen behind me. Psalm 23. This is what he says about the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack, what's the next word? Nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul when I'm weary. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest, scariest, death-filled valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. While my enemies starve, you got food on the table. You anoint my head with oil. You bring healing. My cup, it overflows. Surely your, what's the next word? Goodness. Boy, that sounds like a good shepherd to me. Your goodness and your love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house, in the presence of the Lord forever. Listen, I don't know about you. That sounds like a shepherd I want to follow. 
that sounds like a shepherd worth giving my life to and entrusting my life to because he's the only one who can follow through. And I'll tell you, even more than what we just read in Psalm 23, I'll tell you the, the biggest reason why Jesus is the good shepherd or why Jesus is the great shepherd, like Paul says in Hebrews, is because he laid down his life for the sheep. He laid down his life for you and me when we had no way of making ourselves right before God. He laid himself down willingly on a cross, and he died for your sins. Listen, none of these religious guys in this passage were doing that. None of those things clamoring for your attention that I just listed off, your money and sex and fame and career and whatever else, none of those can do that. There is only one good shepherd, and his name is Jesus Christ. He is worth following with your life. If you're here today and you've never believed, you've never bought into Jesus and you just thought this whole thing was a joke, buy in today and believe. If the Christian, if there's an area of your life where you've been unwilling to give it to Jesus because you don't trust him as the good shepherd, would you lay it at his feet today and say, Jesus, lead me. I'm going to follow your voice in this area of my life. Listen, you will never regret it because Jesus never misses a shot he calls. There is only one shepherd you can follow that can follow through. Have you believed in him today? Have you bought into him today? John wants you to do it. I want you to do it. Follow that good shepherd today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus. Oh, he did for us what we could never do for ourselves. And he offers every day to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. God, we fool ourselves into thinking that we can navigate this life on our own, even as believers sometimes. Father, you've given us Jesus as the good shepherd so that we can learn to follow his voice. God, I don't know what your people brought in today, what they're carrying on their shoulders, but God, would you remind them in this moment that they can trust you as the good, great shepherd who loves them. They can trust you with wherever your voice is leading them or calling them whether it's out on the stormy waters, whether it's through the darkest valley of the shadow of death, like the psalmist said, we can trust our good shepherd, Jesus Christ. Remind your people of that truth today. Give them comfort in that truth this morning. And for the person here that does not know you, that has been in that state of unbelief like the religious leaders we read about, help them to see for the first time that they can believe and buy into Jesus because he is legitimate. He is the Son of God, and He can forgive their sins and give them the abundant life that they've been looking for in all these other avenues. Father, I ask in this moment that you would revive our hearts. I ask that you would save people right now in this moment. Draw them, Lord. Help them to be gloriously saved. Thank you for giving us a good shepherd. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said,